Understanding the genomic changes associated with different types of cancer has perhaps been one of the most important topics of research in the past decade. I am your host Paras Mehta and this week on India to Germany we speak with Dr. Alva Rani Jains who is using deep learning techniques to delve deeper into cancer genomics. Alva did her PhD at the Charity University Hospital in Berlin on deciphering the human cancer genome and she is highly experienced in building bioinformatic and statistical pipelines for analyzing human big data. She is currently working as a postdoc at Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, Germany. Welcome Alva, thank you for speaking with us. Yeah, thank you Paras for inviting me and looking forward to an exciting talk. I have actually a lot of questions for you I have to say you have such an interesting profile um sure. but uh, I... let me start first of all by with the question that's uh, burning in my head mm-hmm. which is about your research mm-hmm. so you uh, your research in the area of using deep learning for cancer genomics I can imagine that's really important for everyone um mm-hmm. what exactly does your work focus on Uh so the work fo- focuses on um elucidating the functions of cancer related RNAs or genes uh which are involved in um certain signaling pathways so the signaling pathways are the pathways which give signals uh to the cancer cells to grow and pro- proliferate and met uh, and spread uh, across the body yeah and um also to and also to elucidate those genes and their so- tumor suppressing activity Uh, across multiple uh, cancer types so our focus is we are mainly looking into a particular kind of gene which is known as non coding genes and which are already reported to be involved in multiple uh, hallmarks of cancer including progression metastatics proliferation so on and so forth so the goal at the end would be to develop a tool that would help physicians to stratify the patients based on their risk group and plan the treatment protocol so technically it would be like a system that would support uh, clinical decision making or cds by leveraging um latest developments in deep learning and bioinformatics uh, especially in combination so yeah that's all about the research part and besides that i'm also involved in developing multiple uh, reproducible workflows or pipelines for various projects uh, which would be uh, a la- i mean in, in the end we will we will publish it for uh, people for the community so people can use it for free yeah so the your work would be uh, basically used by the physician or by the by the specialist to stratify patients like you said based on some risk uh, risk factors yeah. uh, which you are able to produce from your work mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. because um, for instance cancer is a very heterogeneous disease meaning that it's not a single disease it's a group of disease which has got multiple subtypes for instance leukemia if we've taken leukemia it's a blood cancer which has multiple subtypes like philadelphia like philadelphia positive philadelphia negative so on and so forth and each subgroups uh needs very specific treatment for instance some subgroups needs less aggressive treatment protocol another need more aggressive like chemotherapy so if it, if the doctor clinician um get to know uh what what subgroup or which a group the patients belong to then he can really determine which treatment he can give to this patient hence uh, the life quality of the patient and uh, the palliative care for the patient would improve drastically so that is the aim at the end so do you focus on a but on a specific form of cancer or is this a general uh, technique uh, currently we are um, uh, trying to find the functions of the particular kind of rna which i defined before we've mentioned before across multiple cancer type that is across almost all the cancer type because we have consortiums where where uh, the tumor samples are available for more than 20 cancer uh, tumor types and there are subtypes so there are like 250 around uh, plus subtypes available from thousands of patients so um, that's a consortium from the US which is from National Institute of Health which is called Tan 
cancer genome atlas tcga abbreviated as tcga so where you can use the public data and uh, work play around with multiple cancer but then eventually to translate this model to a hospital we have to really do a lot of uh, we need to validate it. And for that, we can only start with single cancer. So that's always based on uh, the availability of samples from the hospital. So uh, in the beginning, we will start with multiple cancers and then we will narrow it down. Yeah, that's the plan. But then it, it's, a, it's a long-term goal. <laughs> in order to get this uh, classification based on risk, a patient has to go to a doctor and he has to, he or she has to get a genetic test done, I imagine. This would be the first step. Um, yes, but then it's not like so direct. For instance, you go into a hospital, I mean, any person who is suspended to, I mean, who is suspecting that he is having some problem, he goes to the hospital, he's diagnosed, then his blood is taken. And from the blood, the DNA and RNA molecules are extracted, which are pretty stable. And it goes into a sequencing facility. And that and those DNA and RNAs are sequenced and it's converted into data. So it's, it's the so-called big data. Uh, so uh, And then this data is used by bioinformaticians or people who are statistician, biostatisticians or computational biologists to find the molecular uh, mechanisms behind it, for like mutations, signatures, uh, biomarkers, and so on and so forth. And this information is given back to the physician. And that would help the physician to make these decisions. Yeah. All right. Okay. But this is not a uh, standard protocol procedure in all hospitals, but some hospitals are practicing it now. Yeah. Some hospitals are already practicing this. Yeah. And what kind of methods are you using for uh, basically finding solutions to the problems that you're working on? So I, I, you're using deep learning, uh, but what specifically? So specifically, we are using a combination of bioinformatics, statistical and deep learning methods uh, for uh, the, tackling these problems and by leveraging uh, the the big human data, like I mentioned, the data, uh, the sequence data from uh, DNA, RNA, and protein levels uh, of the of, from the patients. So, the, typically, the bioinformatics and statistical methods uh, classically involve certain uh, processes uh, like alignment, classification, correlation, causal inference, uh, variant analysis, variation, uh, variant analysis, so on and so forth. Uh, on the deep learning end, we are planning or we are developing series of um, uh, by using series of uh, deep learning models um, you, we are utilizing this sequence space features and trying to develop a model uh, using um, a kind of any neural networks like convolutional neural network or Bayesian or autoencoder which would work best uh, from the sequence of the people and then eventually the best performing model will be valid validated against an independent set of tumor genome to determine uh, the performance accuracy or the prediction accuracy. And further, these rules, uh, the best results are validated in a wet lab because you have to make sure whether or not the machine is predicting the right thing. So, yeah. I mean, you already said, yeah, this is human big data. I can imagine that there are a lot of challenges um, in general, not just related to data, mm -hmm. um, involved in this uh, research in cancer genomics. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about some of those challenges. Yeah, so, um, the, so the, the mainly the genomic data uh, comes with a different formats, uh, file formats for uh, because of each there are multiple genomic data generated using DNA, RNA, and uh, uh, all these um, uh, all these elements from the human body, and they all come in different formats, and there is no uh, and in, in varying amounts in terms of their size, and there is no uniforming APIs, and so to manipulate this uh, data, it, it's really a tedious process, and um, you can certainly use so, uh, Python libraries like NumPy, Pandas to manipulate it uh, to a certain extent, but then um, uh, there are no enough Pythonic ways that's supporting it in, in, a, in a very uh, uniform, uh, there is no optimal way supporting it uh, currently. <clears throat> and uh, so, 
so there are so, so to say there is no straightforward way that's the best way to say it and uh, so that's one challenge and then another one is uh, to communicate with uh, these complex ideas to the collaborators and group members because mostly our groups are often with uh, diverse uh, people with from diverse uh, uh, diverse backgrounds for instance there are mm, medical doctors, mathematicians, molecular biologists. And so you need to really stay updated in your domain knowledge to explain the, uh, everything to all or to all these people. And for that, I need to always listen to lectures, read papers. And uh, for me, it's always a matter of filling my educational gaps. But the, uh, of, of course, it's working well for me because the best part is that I can do it on in my own pace and my own timing. However, it's a challenge, and I really have to stay updated. That's uh, one one thing, yeah. <clears throat> and then the usual challenges like reducing the noise of the data, batch effects, uh, finding the best normalization strategies for the data, for instance. These are all challenges. Yeah. <clears throat> I can imagine that you have some cooperations with uh, university hospitals uh, for your work. Is that the case? Yeah. So currently um, we have a collaborator. I mean, we are talking to this collaborator uh, from Heidelberg. He is uh, a person, as a bench scientist or a wet lab scientist. We will call, we call people who are not working with computer are wet lab scientists. So uh, he uh, has a lot of experience in this uh, non-coding RNA field. So he's one of our collaborator or a talking point where we can ask questions and doubts. So it's not a hospital. It's a group where they do a lot of uh, wet lab experiments uh, to validate the findings from uh, a dry lab. By dry lab, I mean the computer-based uh, or model-based analysis or predict prediction-based analysis. Yeah. So that's one collaboration we have currently. Yeah. I mean, in cancer genomics and deep learning, it sounds like the perfect or very a very good combination of three very hot topics these days. Um, how did you arrive at this topic of research? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> uh, it's be because as a bioinformatician who was really working with, uh, with worked on human data or working uh, with the human data, um, most of the tools I used were based on uh, machine learning methodologies and um, Deep learning, as we all know, it's a sub-disciple of machine learning field, um, has also mm, dominated this field recently uh, because, and it can be used uh, to address variety of questions uh, in the genomics. For instance, understanding how the proteins are binding in the DNA sequences, how the how certain modifications are happening, and predicting uh, expressions of gene on different layers. Of uh, different from different uh, angles, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of applications which uh, the deep learning can up, uh, can be used to uh, um, to explain. Uh, however, despite the number of uh, success uh, or uh, of this uh, deep learning solutions, these are not adapted very well into the bioinformatics community. I am a bioinformatician by myself, so I thought of uh, using it. And now the situation is changing a lot. Uh, for instance, uh, there are a lot of uh, open source tools from big groups like Google Brain out there, which you can use. And also you can make small wrappers out of that and use it in your own model. Like there are so many possibilities now compared to like three years ago. And so now it's the best time to really uh, use deep learning in uh, genomic uh, research or human data-based uh, research. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Yeah, it's uh, deep learning or AI in general is becoming more and more mainstream. And uh, mm. yeah, that's... I yeah, and then that. I like um, for and besides all this, the key to inventing a better drug for cancer because our topic is cancer is to learn thoroughly the the data in all the angles. So deep learning, I believe, would give us this 
new look to the cancer and we can we may see things which have been missing for a long time so it would uh, in uh, i mean at the end it would enable us uh, uh, an effective diagnosis an accurate diagnosis or bring up some smarter models yeah so these are <laughs> the reasons <laughs> Yeah, I, I can imagine actually this topic is really a very popular or and also a very important topic of research. So uh, do you know of other groups or other places which are also working in the same area? Maybe some names come to your mind? Um, in cancer research or? Yeah, or using uh, specifically using deep learning for uh, cancer research? Yeah, there are a lot of groups. The the group which I was working in uh, ETH Zurich uh, in the in the lab which I was working previously, they were they are a machine learning group. They were using a lot of um, human data, which is if in fact the fresh human data which is coming from hospitals uh, to look into different molecular interactions or molecular mechanisms of those patients uh, using more these uh, models, deep learning or machine learning models. And the other name is Google Brain. Like I said, it's a big famous, I mean, uh, you all guys, you guys know uh, Google, yeah? No, Google. So <laughs> they have a, a unit called Google Brain and Google Genomics, where they are also looking in, um, they are mainly focusing on developing open source tools, which can be used by the community later on for free. And... Uh, so there are a lot of research groups uh, focusing on it. And there is a group in Roche, um, pharma company, um, then um, uh, a small uh, unit of uh, bioinformat- I mean, uh, bioinformaticians and machine learning people sitting together, focusing this work. And, and also for in our group, there is a uh, collaboration, not me, but other member of my groups, they are collaborating with uh, uh, this company, uh, uh, electronic company, I forgot, uh, Bosch, yeah, uh, this mm-hmm. German company, yes. So so there are a couple of uh, examples. People are really working on this topic using, but they are using uh, images, so image analysis. Their focus is mainly image analysis, so they use the, uh, the images which are coming from uh, the biopsy samples of cancer, like, for instance, a slide, a uh, slice, uh, piece of a tumor uh, image from uh from breast cancer or kidney, for instance. So they use those images and try to find uh, the, uh, the the biomarkers or the right points in, in, in the image and help the physicians to make decisions. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Whereas on the other hand, you use the actual sequencing yeah, data. Yeah, so so my, the, my, the group is like for my group, for instance, half, I mean, most of the people are working on image analysis. And they are using images from cancer, uh, tumors from uh, your brain, breast cancers, lung cancer, so on and so forth. And we, uh, cause another small part of the group, we are working on sequences, yeah, genomic sequences, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you are a trained bioinformatician. Uh, I can imagine it was a bit of a transition for you. So how did you uh, make this transition? How did you gain these skills? Um, so gaining the skill was uh, actually just by working on it or using the online tools, online resources. Uh, and also, of course, I was working, like I said, I'm working with people from multidisciplinary backgrounds. So it's always easy to talk to people and get the, get their helps. And also the groups I was working uh, uh, currently and I was working in, in, in the past, we had, uh, we, we were always, I mean, I'm, I'm always in an in academia. So you have the university attached to it there are courses available uh, you can go take a course and uh, learn it or you can always do it by your own so uh, so these are the ways I kind of uh, learn the skills or I am learning the skills but uh, data mm, so bioinformatics is a data driven science as it is which uses uh, genomics and uh, utilized largely a lot of techniques from machine learning so I was kind of aware of this, but I wasn't using it uh, as a machine learning engineer or a deep learning engineer. But then that was a kind of, I ho- I got a foray to it uh, with uh, working in as a bioinformatician, but I started learning it uh, recently, I would say, uh, through resources online, through the courses and through people around me. Yeah. 
And what is it that got you interested in research? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So I was never um, a kind of, yeah, I was never planning to be a researcher. Um, I come from India and uh, I grew up in North and Kerala in South India. So I I would really say that I'm really so thankful and blessed to have astonishing parents who give me a lot of freedom and they had also amb- ambitions for me for instance my mother my mom want me uh, to study or continue in science and engineering and then go on with masters and do a, a phd on it in the same field which is quite rare because i did my bachelor's in bioinformatics masters in bioinformatics and uh, systems biology and my phd in bioinformatics so this is kind of i never changed my field and that was really because my parents had huge ambitions for me uh, and they were encouraging me Uh, but the crucial step happened when i moved to sweden to pursue um um, the 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 masters yeah and after completing bioinformatics engineering in bioinformatics in india i got a chance to pursue masters in sweden uh, in shalmos university which is a technical university and during that time after the first year in the summer break I got an amazing opportunity to work with a company called AstraZeneca where I was working in digitalizing tables and figures from literature about Alzheimer's patient and uh, it was in the first summer break and after that I got because it I, with that name on my CV, I got uh, to work with small groups in multiple places in uh, in Sweden, for instance, in Schalgrenska in Gothenburg, and then SciLife Lab or Karolinska in Stockholm, and so on and so forth. And after that, I got a good chance to do my master thesis with SciLife Lab, which is, in a, uh, which is like a hybrid research center from KTH and Karolinska. So where uh, that was the point where I... I got to work to benchmark uh, some methods which are available for big human data. And that was the first time I got exposed to big human data, which was in tetrabyte size. And more than that, uh, as it was the, the, it was the beginning of cloud computing schedulers and so on and so forth. I got exposed to it or I got to work with them, batch systems and uh, sending job, bad jobs and things like that. And during this project, uh, honestly, this project did a lot for me. So first, it confirmed that I want to do PhD. Second, it was my real foray into learning programming because before I knew a little bit, but not enough. And additionally, that was my first experience reading some scientific papers. So looking into the language, the scientific language, how the figures looks like and how things are getting done. So these are, in fact, all useful for me. And then I have also learned how to work independently and manage the data. And most of, most importantly, this, that thesis helped me to decide for PhD. Uh, And besides that, I love the autonomy, uh, love being able to choose the time when I want to work. Like, for instance, you do not have to work eight hours. You can also work during the night and next day you can sleep (laughs) or something like autonomy. I mean, so in research, nobody is really looking at you. (laughs) When are you working? The results are important. Yeah. So (laughs) and these opportunities, in fact, shaped the researcher in me. And by having all these names on my CV, it was easy for me to find a PhD. And by then I had two published papers in in a very, in fact, in reputed or in impactful journal. And it got easier for me to get a PhD position or to be a researcher. So that's, that it was really, it was a gradual process. It happened gradually, I would say. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, the credit re- largely goes to the, the mentors and the professors I had, the great colleagues I had. Then, so yeah, it, it was a lot of people contributed to it. Yeah, thankfully. Great. That sounds very nice. And then you continued with your uh, PhD at the Charité. Yes. Uh, I then, uh, so after that, I got this, uh, for many reasons, I want to do a PhD in Germany because Germany has got a lot of uh, quality work in cancer research, especially at that point of time. And so I applied in uh, German uh, uh, DKF set, which is known as German Cancer Consortium, and they really was taking a lot of PhD students then. And then I got this position with Charity and uh, German Cancer Research Institute. Yeah, it was in 2014. Yeah. 
and now after that you came to the Hasselblatt Institute. Yeah, after completion of my PhD, I would I really got a job uh, in in Switzerland as data analyst in ETH Zurich. Uh, so I got I worked there for one year and a half. Yeah. So and after that I. I got married, so for family for family reunion purpose, I came back to Germany. And I, my husband is from Potsdam, so we kind of uh, want to live together. And we were looking for uh, the positions which are near our place. Uh, so th- that's how we were looking in Hasselblattner. And I know Hasselblattner because my sister was working for SAP in Heidelberg, and she she she, she I, in fact told me that you should look into Hasselblattner because they have really good work going on there. And then I looked into the the list of professors in the in, in their website and I found this professor and I I asked him uh, whether or not he could give me a place and thankfully he gave me a place I'm so thankful and that's how I came here yeah very impressive actually really impressive um yeah actually so many very uh, yeah reputed institutions um and so much good work it's really very impressive <laughs> thank you um, yeah and so from your experience i mean you have lived in different countries now you have lived in sweden and switzerland you're living in germany now and you come from india um how has your experience uh, been or how would you compare perhaps a little bit um yeah i mean uh, to start uh, with a philosophical answer it ultimately shaped my <laughs> character or perception towards world <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i mean first of all you get an opportunity to explore yourself and to know yourself better because i like i said in india i had no idea i would be doing or continuing in research to be very honest and because i worked with different people because i had this uh, opportunities to go into different places and work with different people i kind of explored that yeah i could do this or i could also do this and secondly, uh, these experiences give, uh, gave me a lot of strength uh, to face challenges, uh, which I didn't, ha- I didn't have before because, yeah, so many reasons. And then it's, it's an advantage. In fact, you can learn from different people, yeah, from uh, different work styles. For instance, I worked with people, not just Swedish people alone, but also people from different nationalities, uh, kind of I would call from almost all continents and then you can work learn from their work styles um, some for instance some people really perfectly plan their time they know to manage then some people really know to talk with people and get their things done some people really know to clearly communicate so many things you can learn from different people and then eventually you can all use all these ideas and tailor it in a way that that will fit and suit your own goals and ambitions so i honestly did that because i didn't have my own pattern uh, there must be people like that i'm sure but my case was different so i learned from multiple people and i t- tailored it in a way that suit my goal and my ambitions and um uh, if I compare the countries, uh, undoubtedly, uh, Germany uh, has a lot of opportunities now, especially if you have some sort of technical skills and uh, and you don't need to learn the German language for that. And uh, so as in Switzerland and Sweden, uh, especially if you know some computer skills, like for instance, language skills, computer language skills, not the language, the computer language skills. And... Uh, Advantage, if you, if I compare Germany and uh, other countries, Germany, the cost of living is really, really low compared to Sweden okay. and Switzerland. <laughs> that yeah. would be one. But other, besides that, there is no huge difference in terms of infrastructure and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, and uh, to ask you for some advice uh, for our listeners who are also interested in research and in the area of cancer genomics and deep learning. Uh, what would you say are some of the important topics of research in cancer genomics data? Um, so there are uh, so many interesting uh, topics in this um, uh, research, for instance, uh, the immunotherapy, uh, which is uh, very, I mean, the, the, the opportunities there are enormous, uh, cancer immunotherapy, where you can really look into uh, the interplay between the cancer cells and the immune system and 
Second is a mutational signature where you can look into uh, how, why some sort of people who are exposed to different environmental conditions having different sort of mutations and how it is contributing towards cancer. And then also you can, uh, uh, single cell sequencing is another emerging field where you can use, uh, you can look into a, a cell into more zoomed fashion and get um, more ideas how the cells are communicating with one another uh, and how the cell metabolism is happening, so on and so forth. So these are some very important uh, topics uh, one can look into, yeah. Great, thank you. And would you have any suggestions for people looking to work in this area? <laughs> suggestions? Um, yeah, of course, I would really, I mean, if if you are looking to uh, work into this um research field i would really really recommend you to stay updated stay updated meaning um, that you try to read the literature the papers so now you can even read papers from archives not you don't have to wait until the peer review is happening so you can have multiple archives where people are really publishing uh, dozens of paper on a daily basis use your uh, the keywords which you want to look for and then search for the papers, find the paper, read it, try to understand every sentence. And if you want to really look for peer reviewed paper, you can use search engines. I mean, you can use uh, the databases like PubMed uh, from NIH uh, and uh, you can use your keywords and find the papers you need and read it. Go through the other names. And if you find that paper is interesting, find who is the the, the corresponding author of the paper, and you can write them and ask them, okay, I like your research. May I work with you? It, it works. I mean, if you are really interested, if you know to write the mail very well, it helps to get some access to the group and can really, really train yourself with the group. Another thing is network and collaborate with people. Uh, that is also something like this. Be open to talk to people and find what you need to know to do. And if you are getting any chance to work with the people of your interest or the group of your interest, try to get always good reference from the professors and mentors you work with. Uh, always try to go out of the group with a good reference letter, which really helps, especially in Europe. I don't know about the US, but in Europe, it really helps. Your reference letter w goes a long, long way, especially if you're working with a good reputed professor. <clears throat> And then you can, of course, use LinkedIn, Google, Glassdoor. There are multiple places you can look for positions. And uh, if you want to go into research, of course, you can go to, uh, use, uh, like like I said, first find the right, right professor reading papers. You can find the right people and then write to them, go to their web page, write to them, contact them directly and try to get, I mean, ask them whether or not they have a position and then write to them. Always make sure that you have a good CV and a cover letter and a motivation letter. I mean, regarding, okay, I read your paper. I like this research, blah, 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 something like that. So it should be really good and uh, professional. So make sure you, I, th I really recommend to put a lot of time making good CV and cover letter. So, yeah. So these are the things which really helped me. So I would say. Yeah, I, I have to thank you, Alva, for sharing all your knowledge and your experience with your research and with your experiences in these different countries uh, in this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share <laughs> about uh, the work I did. Yeah. You're it was welcome. really great talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all, folks. Remember to subscribe to our podcast and check out our blog at indiatogermany.com. See you in the next episode.